Welcome to this mini meeting. Thanks, Terry, for being online. Um, any apologies? No? Um, we don't have a public forum. Any items not on the agenda that anyone's going to surprise us with? No. I doubt if there's any conflicts of interest, but tell me if we get to anything that um, comes to that. <coughs> and then we'll go to the minutes for confirmation, which are on page two. Is someone that was there, is that a true and correct record? Happy to move. So Terry's <laughs> moving, Gary's seconding. Is there any issues? on that that we're not covering on the general meeting that anyone wants to bring up. So then we go to... You to move those minutes. Okay, so all those in favour? Aye. Thank you, Gary. So then we go to page seven, which is the district manager's report. Thanks, Gary. Good morning, all. Um, so yes, this is the first meeting since the 9th of December, I suppose. So one's wrong, we've had a, we've had a summer. So um, in December, of course, we were very much involved in preparation for what we understood was to be a, a very, very busy summer. As it turns out, the Eastern Seaboard, especially from the car, were very, very busy. The rest of the peninsula was normal to slightly above normal. Uh, we've just got some spend data in which indicates there was quite a lot of, there's a much more budget spent on the peninsula um, during this time as well. So, um, a report has been compiled for council, um, probably that meeting. With all that data combined into one space, and um, uh, yeah, it's, it'll be the front runner for an annual report um, where all the data comes together. Because what happens is each department tends to report on stats and information, so we're just going to put it all in one place. But overall, it was quite a bit. Some of the infrastructure guys got through, we didn't have any major water issues. Solid waste is always a problem, it's just absolutely maxed out. Got through it. Um, we didn't have any major storms, we didn't have any cyclones that were predicted. It's still cyclone season, but there's nothing came. So um, we didn't dodge a bullet. I think we were all very well prepared. We did a lot of work, and thanks to comms, um, a huge amount of information and the subliminal messaging went out for weeks and weeks ahead. So, food, <coughs> water, fire risk, and all that stuff. I tell you what, it plays, it really, really works. Um, in its own little way. So, thanks to everybody because it was very much a team effort. Um, the disconnection with the siren system, we've made progress on that and we are now ready to use the pro program uh, subject to this committee signing off on the guidelines that we have agreed to with things. Um, so, from today, if we do get the resolution, we'll be commencing. Recovery manager, once again, there's a report of catch. There's been a change um, over the last couple of years regarding how the role of the recovery manager works, and it is receiving much more priority on the um, civil defence emergency management ladder than it has in the past. So there's a report there that um, brings it in house, and um, in the interim, it'll, I'm seeking that um, I get appointed as recovery manager. It's a lot I've been doing pretty much anyway, quite the pop. Um, so we're just going to get signed off. <coughs> COVID 19, as we all know, it's just ongoing and we are constantly in resurgence planning. We just, um, all of us are involved, we have regular conversations and updates. And right now, what we are doing is we've been asked to identify. Um, all weather drive through sites or instant CVAT testing. So we're coming into winter, so Pam is leading the charge on that. So we're going to places like, um, let's just say, uh, retired petrol stations that have got a community, places like that. 
pools where you can grow fruit. So by Friday, we need to get back to the ministry of where we can have possible sites. So it's just ongoing, and uh, yeah, we're just always ready to get involved in the management of the roads and everything else. Uh, EU engagement, uh, we've made some progress on that, and um, I'll get to have them um, shortly during our um, work program to give you an update on We've got some well, I identified that we're going to be working with, and uh, we've got a program on the back of our mind to deliver. Water tank refills, thankfully, we have not had to use that fund that has been made available by the government. Every time the tanks get loaded, we get that, that rain, and um, so they're constantly topped up. Um, Sorry, just to the I just noticed Gary, that should be 1920. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah
the marae is at Haraka at Kennedy Bay and Manaia Marae. So um, the first step is identifying the marae. What I'm doing in the background is <coughs> reaching out to civil defence partners across New Zealand and seeing what has been successful in terms of marae training. Probably the most successful package is what they're doing in um, Taupo, where they have aligned with fire and health and they go in and do a package. But it's not about a training with PowerPoint, it's about going out and lots of large start, lots of activity and probably just focusing for our part on the emergency preparedness and then from that identify if there's any further training that they want. So early days, but it's good. There's, a, there's lots of good stuff that's been done around the country that we can tap into. Cool. That certainly was a focus at the regional meeting <coughs> earlier in the week. They've actually adjusted their plan for the year to spend more, to focus more on Uwe because of the, the role of Uwe and the COVID welfare stuff, etc. So, um, you know, lots of support for that. Mm -hmm. And if we around the table do more of what we can help with any relationships or anything, I'm not so good on Kennedy Bay, but I do have contacts at Manaya and up the hill here, and Bruce, um, Martin and Robin and Terry, if it's over the other side. So, you know, and if you need us to be there to make the cups of tea or whatever, I'm saying we, I, um, really happy to support that because I think it's really important and I don't think it's easy necessarily for individuals just to move in, you know, if you have to with your back, if you need us to come to and be part of that calling in and stuff, well then we're there for you, okay? That's great, right, thank you. Anything else on training while we're here? We might as well. Oh, okay, the other part of the training that we're working on is um, the long term plan performance measure for all the councils in the Waikato now has been made a consistent measure around um, using exercises as an indication of the success of training. So um, I'm working, I'm in a working group with others looking at planning a tier two exercise in November. So that means that Waikato Group plus all the councils will participate in that exercise. Um, and out of that we'll do, we've got a set of um, standardised performance indicators that we'll use to benchmark where we're at with our emergency operating centre. And then that identifies gaps in training. And then the idea is that we just get better and better every year. So a bit of work on putting the exercise together, but it will be. Um, we haven't done a big exercise here for a couple of years. We just keep having the events. Yes. <laughs> no, thanks for that. Um, is there anything else on those pages? If not, I can take you to page 15, I think. It's about page, uh, page 14. Yeah, um, just around the uh, tsunami and siren. Have we got a report on that later? On the There's a report coming on that, yeah. Oh, okay, that's cool. Can we, is that, a, is that okay if we hold it for that? Yep. If there's not, we'll go to the last page, which is other projects. These, these are things that pop up in the work program um, that we need to include. Um, and so the sectorisation one, if you recall, we've um, been spending the last two years on this working with emergency management and it's all about layers so that if we have an emergency we can just bring up on the screen every single community, every street, if there's a fire response, what side of the street, what the numbers are, it goes right down to my most minute detail. And then there's a layer upon layer on top of that. So FEMS, we've pretty much finished it and FEMS are now going to do a, their own tabletop exercise to hopefully stick and see if it works. So, um, it sounds a bit innocuous to anything else, but it actually has been a very good project and well supported and it's a, it's a New Zealand first. So if it works for things this time around, then you'll probably see it with our name on it going all over the place. Um, the, the, the safer comment, or what I think we need to pay, <coughs> give some credit to the work safer comment we did over the summer because they had a very good communications budget with uh, MediaWorks and there's a lot of messaging going out. Um, there was uh, water, fire risk 
and there's also a, um, what was the other one was about? Surf life saving. Surf life saving and family violence. Family family violence. violence. Yeah. So it's a whole lot, and um, so that's now part of the, what we call the use committee, which is the Eastern Waikato Emergency Response Group. Mm -hmm. This is fire, police, and both stop. There's about 11 of us. And it's, we've retained that committee from when the TV EOA, when we divorced in 2018, that committee stayed. And it's probably got more strength now than it ever has. Um, so we met the other day, and um, having saved the Coromandel in that hub was paying off. And we're really pleased with it. And what we're doing is really just supplying <coughs> some administrative support. There's no cost to it. We're not putting any dollars into it. It's just um, part of what we do. So this might sound like an ignorant question. Um, what is Sacred Coromandel, or who is Sacred Coromandel? So Sacred Coromandel was started by police. Um, back in Graham Shields days, back in 2016-17. Um, and it was about the fact that a whole lot of people were dying on a coromandel over the summer, for all sorts of reasons. Right. Most of them were unfit men having heart attacks because they've got new toys to play with. <laughs> but still, what gotta, it, still gotta help those people. <laughs> uh, but it, but what, it, what it came down to is when police analysed all the data, there were a lot of road accidents, there was a lot of violence because of alcohol, there was a lot of things going on. And so they teamed up with media works, um, and our input, our, our, our uh, road right safety coordinator. And pretty much that was it at, at that time. And then it has morphed itself out, and other interest groups have now joined it, yeah. including civil defence and emergency management, um, and fire and all that. And, and we're all contributing to it in terms of what the messaging. So we're sharing a platform of messaging. Right. So that's that's really all it's and media works the sponsor, they go and get some dollars. So they have a budget every year that they throw into it. So, so I've probably goes, seen I mean I've probably seen stuff that they put out and I probably just haven't connected to this. Yeah. So that's what it is, it's just about especially the Coromandel, it's it's um, <coughs> it's targeting people that visit. And um, we're looking to expand it so um, while Maud's online we might get her to mention that they have an app um, that when you came onto a call man over the summer, it pinged on your phone. Do you want to just expand on that, Paula, for us? Are you talking about the responsive um, design campaign that we use, the digital what? online campaign? Yeah. Yeah. So we, what we did is we um, worked with a, an agency to um, do a digital campaign where anyone who came into the Coromandel. Um, and was geocach to um, geocach to our district. They'd get an, um, a, a pop up on their device, um, and it would be about just a, a you know a public education to say a water conservation um, check this area. There um, is, could be restrictions in place, and so you know if you were on your Instagram feed, it would pop up. <laughs> your, um, I Heart Radio, you'd get a, an audio ad about it. So. Um, that ran from I think Christmas Eve through till just the end of February, and we benchmarked that we wanted to get about four hundred thousand um, what we call um, I guess you call them like a ping, where it would just um, ping to someone's um, device or whatever, and we actually doubled what we had benchmarked. So we got about eight hundred thousand um, connections through that campaign. So it was a very very successful and just lots of um, different avenues digitally that we were able to alert people about water conservation and water restrictions. Thanks. Well, there you go. That's just an example of technology moving on. And we've talked about sirens. That's just one avenue. What we're going to do is talk to the water team about using that company during winter regarding the big cross app and other things like that. Because So as we change our methodology around alerting, we're going to something like that and maybe take it into the summer. So, um, yeah. Gary, can I also say um, there was a, a, with having the trailers at all of those strategic spots around the district was really, really useful for people driving through. And also um, just to acknowledge the water services team because they worked with quite a lot of different communities around the district. Um, one example was Ha Hay. Uh, where the water services team, we had project meetings with the Hahe um, community probably about three months leading into um, peak summer, and there was huge buy in from their community um, to let their, their residents and ratepayers know. So it was a bit of a partnership 
in that respect. And we um, got some really good feedback from that community as well. So um, I just want to acknowledge the water services team for that too. Cool. So we had, how many VMS totals did we get in? Three. Sorry. Oh, so we had four VMS trailers, the big message trailers. <coughs> we had one of our own that we own, and we walked three in, and they were parked around the peninsula. Mainly the water messaging, I think, wasn't it, Bruce? Yeah. And um, the board was just wouldn't plan that. And the one that we had, I remember, in front of a car, sat outside the fire station, week after week, so every time we came to the roundabout, <laughs> concerned water. You know, it was just boom, boom, boom. So, yeah. Um, I think I think they pick up on what Lorna and Gary have said, they're very effective because they're not normally there. And so they stick out and they're ugly. When you drive into town, this is a giant big board sitting right there, and you think that wasn't there last time I drove it here. And no one's got messages on, you know, yeah, so it's really brilliant. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's not like when we put up our own signage, you know, that's just there all the time. It's signage, it's, it's a temporary thing. You can see it's temporary. So it really has a big impact. So what I've talked about for my team with Gary, I think we need to actually do more of that. Yeah. And I suppose the challenge for us is we did go hard out on water conservation and on fire issues this year. Previous years we probably went harder up on um, alcohol bans and we didn't push those so much. We pushed the water conservation and fire because they were our biggest risks. So I think we've got good results on those two cases. <laughs> Possibly not as good on the other one, whereas in the past we've had better results on that and we've struggled in the water and the fire site. So you know, we can't do everything, but it's just interesting to see how that stuff works. So, um, Can I get there too, Bruce? I agree because last year, uh, sorry, the previous year before this one, um, there was a huge push on solid waste um, yes. and, and about acknowledging collections. But also, um, all of these these tactics that we use, it is an additional cost because we only have a certain budget for the year. So the trailers and doing, you know, um, an amplified campaign does cost more money. So there's some merit in considering going down and actually purchasing more of these trailers because as we head into the, the future with instant messaging, they are very, very effective. And, uh, what are the cost estimates for? Oh, I was going to say about 20 grand. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, you know, we're going to have more toys. To find a parking space, we can sell more of their things. We don't know where to park them. Um, so that concludes the work program. Is there anything else that we have anyone would like to speak on staff? Anything you want to comment on, Terry, in the work program? Or the no, thanks. No, it all looked pretty straightforward and green, so okay. Okay. Anyone else? Am I shouting? I'm not so mm -hmm. sure. Um, right, so I'm going back to the um, suggested resolution which we received the district manager's report. So have I got a mover for that? It's Robin and seconder, Martin, thanks Anna. All those favour? Cool. So on we go to page 15 to talk about our famous sirens. Okay, so just to recap on this, um, in July last year, um, the senior received a letter from uh, Nima uh, advising us to disconnect the sirens. And um, there was the paging system attached to the siren. So what we do is a part, so we've got 20, 27 sirens on the peninsula. All but apart from nine are Fens sirens. So we have attached, we've, 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 we've put a parasite paging system on there whereby we can influence it and put out our tsunami site. Nine of them are what we call community owned, but in fact, all the evidence we've unearthed this week indicates that the community boards of the day, this is back in 2005, 6, 7, 8, they all paid for them out of grants and everything else. So all the sirens are on council land or attached to buildings that are on council land and they will be paid for by um, council grants, by the way, that is. And so anyway, so we were told to disconnect and um, so since then we've been working with FEMS on how that can happen. We've now come to an agreement with FEMS, subject to this committee's approval, that we will disconnect by September 30th this year. And there's a process for that. So one is right now we are gathering all our 
intelligence and information to build a case to take to the communities to talk to them about it. And, the sec and then there was a process of working with comms to tell the story and, and get it out. So there's a process there for the committee to consider. We are at a stage, um, the sirens compared to cell alert and everything else are only 44% effective. They're the last of the most effective methods of communicating an emergency message. So we now have to buy the water and make things disconnected and things can get on with their own technology rebuilding. The, in the summary, um, I'm expecting that when we go to the communities, especially on the eastern seaboard, that there will be some pushback. Um, and we've had an indication <coughs> that as to why, why are you doing this? What's the point? And then sirens for a lot of people is all they've known all their lives. And so you know, to adapt to get that same thing that there's a change coming. So we are planning for um, some interesting community meetings. But what we're looking for is a mandate from this committee to say, yes, make it happen, get on with it. Um, and uh, then we will work with Ben Spence who agreed to come on board and team up with us. So when we do go to these public meetings, they will be there as well. It's not just us carrying the community. So once we're through, What's our projected coverage with phones and everything else that we're going to do? It will be at the moment we're about ninety-three percent. So that is peak. So what we've done is we've taken a peak population like on the twenty-fifth of December in any one year. Can we reach the population that's on the peninsula? And yes, ninety-three percent. We know we can get to. By the time the disconnect has happened, we probably will be up by hopefully by 96 percent. Because we're working with the Rural Connectivity Trust, um, and I'll get Dan to give us a quick update on that too. But this is sorry, that's straight out of the bus. Um, but we had some information come through yesterday as to where they're at with their new cell towers. Um, so yeah, it's a marked shift as to where we're going to be. But there's going to be a lot of cons, and um, we're also, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll talk to that um, that company about putting a subliminal message out uh, when we come on to the show. Martin? So, um, I, I mean, I don't know if we get too picky about figures, but with that, not to 93% of peak, so like Christmas Eve type of thing. So, but are those people, uh, are a lot of those people in sort of more concentrated areas? I'm just wondering when that peak drops, how does that figure? Look, I mean, I know there's still going to be little bays and things that, that might not get cell phone coverage, but may get it shortly with more towers and things going. But how does that figure look just for the ordinary, you know, non peak So when we were doing this, we had we had some 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 good advice, and it's all relative. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a population of around 30,000 <coughs> residents, um, and we would expect that we lose 93 percent of them. Um, as as well as the peak population of 300,000. But there will be little bays and little nooks and crannies that we'll never get to. I don't have a siren now. Um, but there are other things, I mean, there's you know, a lot of uh, phone trees and. Yeah, and your community response work. Community response plans. So um, there will, we'll never get a home never ever. And that's what I recall um, about a decade ago, Vodafone were contracted by the government to provide 100% cell phone coverage on the state highway network. We're just reinforcing the Don't in your face 
signage that is really going to underpin what we're trying to do here because it will indicate you need to use your phone, but this is to educate you yeah. as well. And I think that's the real, it's, it's, it's the, the two working together that will help that yeah. district improve. Yeah. Right. So you see that there's a comment here on page 16 of the report <coughs> about the tsunami evacuation project that we could use for the new financial year. We've got a good, good budget for it and um, we'll do a good, good job of it. So, um, Pam, just a little more on connectivity. Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, sorry, I didn't pick that up. Thanks. Uh, just around that 8%, Gary, just trying to get my head around it. Is it um, lack of coverage in a certain area, and is that coastal, or does it just mean that there's certain blackouts in areas where there are normally coverage? I just need to understand where the issue is. So, for example, Terry, when you're driving from Whanamata to Thames, there are areas of the Kaupu Hill that you can get coverage in these areas where you can't. And that's probably indicative of the whole peninsula. There are black spots all around, but they're not in the main population areas. So, the main, all of the main communities have cell phone connection. It's just the little wee bays where they're probably predominantly um, holiday making or, you know, the, the, the batches of maybe six or seven or eight residents, um, those are the most affected. Okay, yeah, so it's, yeah, I can understand the coverage. That's good, thank you. And no, I know, and then we'll go to Pam, um, and it's purely from the press, um, that the tower on the plan to put these sirens in is behind time, mm -hmm. over budget, et cetera, et cetera. So, and yeah, so I think that's, um, yeah, just something else to consider. Well, one thing I would really appeal for if we haven't already got it is a very graphical representation of who hasn't got coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that needs to be on our website, front and centre, and with it embedded into the community response plans that we have prepared. Because it makes it very clear that you don't have this as a tool, so you need to make sure you have other tools, because it's our job to help them have other tools and that's where yeah. phone trees will then become even more important. Yeah. And what you do find is that the local radio stations, because we now have very good radio coverage on, they are filling in those black spots. So the message from the radio station and no one warns us now very strongly. So, um, Back to you, Ken. <coughs> um, I only received a feedback from um, my contact at RCG yesterday. Um, and yes, I can I can send out the information to you guys. There's 10 sites that I can count here that have been identified as black spot areas that they've been working on. And um, just for instance, I'll just take um, Port Charles for instance. That they started on the north and they're working their way down south. Port Charles. Um, Sorry, Pam. Can I just have, are they confidential at the moment? So we're just reporting. That's all. Um. So how about we just hold that information, give you time to process it, and it will come through the process as we develop, you develop your plans, because from what I understand today, we're confirming that we think your time frames make sense, and then let's put that detailed information into later. the plans later. How does that sound? Sounds good. Right. Um, Robin, it's just a comment really, because you know, I do spend a lot of time with elderly and I've had a lot of feedback about oh we, we don't use cell phones and so I think that we just really to, need to be really clear in our heads and particularly when you guys are, are going to these public meetings and we're going to these public meetings that um, coverage does not equal connectivity and so you might be able to say theoretically 95% of TEMS is or 93 or 9800 or whatever percentage it is of TEMS is able to receive <coughs> But the number of people who are actually receiving them is probably lower because there'll be a whole cohort of people who don't have cell phones. And I think that's where my community, Pam's community, at all of our community work. response comes in is that, you know, if we had to leave our cold set, we would not leave without the elderly cars who live above us. Yeah. We would somehow be sitting in as well. I and think that's that all nice part of the messaging is yeah. that you know, we, we actually do need to look after our neighbours. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that side of this developing well, and Pam's got a PowerPoint for us later on as to why that's working well and, 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 and why after that. Um, 
Yeah, I'm very, very confident that the disconnection of the silo and pager system is not going to affect us at all. I mean, it's just a matter of getting really good comms out and um, just getting the message that there are better options. Cool. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm moving to the uh, suggested resolution on page 16 is that we receive the report and we approve the timeline for the process presented to disconnect the tsunami warning sirens from the pens. Have I got a mover for that? Oh, oh Martin, I'll second it. All those in favour? Okay. You happy, Terry? Yeah, happy. Yeah, no trouble. Thank you. Thank you. So then we move on to the recovery manager. Thanks, Gary. Mm -hmm. So the, the role of the recovery manager um, takes over when the controller has finished the response. So if we have an emergency and yeah, it's a big one, um, once people are safe and everything else, and there's a hell of a mess sitting there, generally the controller stands back, the recovery manager comes in and goes for how long? Like in Christchurch, it's coming 10, 10 years. They've had recovery down there. So for us, um, for the last uh, or eight or nine years I've been doing this job, we've had 35 events and we recover to some degree after every event. So it's not working with NZTA to open roads, it's working in Tupuru to get the skip rooms in and clean up the mess and get the people happy and everything else. So by default, it's a role that the emergency management unit and myself have been doing all of this time. We did um, um, Four years ago, discussions with Rob, we needed to externalise our contracts with the recovery because Rob didn't want his senior staff tied up with a major recovery yeah. because you just you lose them and they're gone. Yeah. And they take priority. So we tried that and it worked for a couple of years, but both of the gentlemen that we had contracted had retired. And then there's been a fresh look at it from a national perspective, and they've come on board to say, yeah, we're quite happy that the controller can become a recovery manager within a council. It makes sense, you take off one hand and just move into the other. And so this report is about that, and it's just seeking endorsement and resolution from this committee that I take over the role of recovery manager, and that. Um, it's just the wrong thing doing anyway. Right, and so in, in my brain, um, it just becomes an, an operational issue as to looking after the staff if you've been up for five nights and haven't had any sleep. You know, so that just becomes the job of the structure and it's, yeah. So 90% of our recovery, Bruce and I are working on the councils. And so Bruce's staff will be going to swap swap minutes on that as to what we're going to do with how we're going to make it. So, but that's from the more environmental effect, that's where we're doing things and so forth. Um, major earthquake and everything else that will be an international response anyway, and we'll be making the tea. So, yep. um, this is more about what's good for this, this council. Has anyone got any questions or concerns about that? Do you want to say anything, Terry? No, thank you. All good. Cool. Anyone else? It makes sense to me. I'm, I'm looking for fish hooks and I can't find any. So we'll receive the report and endorse the appointment of Gary, and that will go back to the joint committee, which does all this formal thing. So have I got a mover for that resolution? Yep. Robin and uh, Martin will second it. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Terry's talking to Jacinda or someone at the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, the, there's a PowerPoint that. Um, cool. Thank that you. <laughs> Just a quick presentation to um, That's show you beautiful you, scenery. <laughs> really, it's a, an opportunity to just um, not brag, but very pleased 
that we are finally sold. <laughs> no, not even that. Um, very grateful that we have finally finished the community response brochures, which is a project that pretty much started when I started this role. And I've done 25 communities today. So the, the reason or the purpose of this is that we have informed and resilient communities and we have a process that's established to enhance our connection with communities and educate communities. So in all these conversations that I'm hearing and everything that we do, the one thing that is most important for me in not failing as a council and helping people is being connected and education. And community response is supposed to be education. And a lot of the elder community, this is where we step in. Yeah. So there's a, I could have made my map a little bit, a little bit bigger. There's 25 community response brochures created. So originally, I've left some examples on the table. The brochure is the folded one, and that's how they used to come. It was a um, something council used to produce, and we used to put it in letter boxes, and people stuck it on their fridge. We're still going to keep that format, but we also decided to create posters because it's so much easier to print and stick on your fridge and you don't lose any of the information. It's a little bit wordy, wordy but um, it's also great for notice boards and putting up the window, shop windows or wherever you want to display it. So those are, every community has a brochure and poster. Um, these are, have just become available on the TCDC website, so if you go to Emergency Management tab, um, you'll find all of these available there. The good thing is we have, um, I've promoted this release to all our community response groups, um, all HP facilities, every campground um, and schools. So it's going to go, the link or the specific community information is going to go out um, electronically now and we have budget to print these and distribute them through their box drops um, in the new financial year. And I just gave you an example of what they look like, but I've decided to print some out for you to have a have a read. Um, that's pretty much it. Cool. One of the most important things that have happened, and um, so if we have a message, so if we've got a major weather event coming up, you know, so just ring pan. And within seconds, she's got hold of every one of those 25 communities with the message. And it's those communities disseminate that amongst themselves. So once again, it's just another layer of the meeting. So those that with our cell phones can still get that message via one, you know, via email or via phone call or via something. So I'm um, pretty pleased with the way that's, that's coming on. It's been well worth the investment. So on our coast, I see Wyoming there, mm -hmm. and then you come down to Te Peru. Like places like Taru have different needs, so to me, living up on the hill up there, um, so Thames is a different beast, or? Yes, Helen will explain our thinking around Thames. So I think there's two more to do, isn't there? Thames and Copeland. Right. The Thames is a slightly different situation because community response is about um, to particularly for telecommunications, how will the community respond and look after itself? So Thames is bigger, so it's not just one community, it's a collection of communities. Yes. But also it has the emergency operating centre will be running likely from Thames, and we also have you know police, fire, St John, yes. our agencies. But most importantly, we also have our welfare agencies. So we have a concern representative, the Ministry of Social Development. So our local welfare committee um, that meet regularly, a lot of them are based in Thames. Yes. So what we do have, and um, this is a priority for this year to rebuild, is actually a Thames welfare group. And that's representation from the Thames-based welfare agencies already working within this space. So instead of the community at Peru setting up a hall and contacting people, we reach out through our welfare group. Mm. So in particular, it's like pathway as well for mental health 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it is something that needs a rebuild. We are aware of that, but at the moment, it's our rich is right Cool. That makes sense. Pretty much, teams has a response plan already. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yep. But there's no reason why. Um, I'm just speaking to the designer now. Why we can can't make a brochure and a poster for teams, but we there's a few things that want to change. It's going to look a little bit different. Um, yes. Any questions? No, thanks, thanks. That's really useful. And well done. And it doesn't stop there because suddenly somebody gets sick, wins <coughs> a million in Lee's town or whatever. And, you know, yes. so, yeah. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention, just yesterday I had contact with WRC who are very happy about these. They're going to promote, the, send people to the link on our website as well and um, going to promote it on their radio slots and in their newsletters as well. So Excellent. We like that. We like thinking with the regional council. Um, so how fast um, south have we got plans for communities in the south? Like Hikatara, that you mean? Yeah. No, it, it pretty much lots of cocoa, I would say. Right. Um, because that's the area that's... I suppose we do go to Peru, but... Peru's got a fire station. Where there's a fire... Sorry, where there's a fire station that... Um, there's like a, already an emergency response process within that community. So potentially actually put it there, we should probably mm. have some sort of plan. Kopu, we haven't got one, but that will, that's part of that Marae. Um, that, that will be connected with that Marae training and working through that. And the business association. So yes. that's right. that, that put it there that time. Yeah. Good point, Mark. And it's just, it's, oh, as a community board, we tend to yeah, they have kind of, to remember to they go. They kind of get forgotten. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Okay, so I'll move on to the members' reports. Um, you got anything you want to add, Robin, Martin? Right, Terry, are you there? Um, well, I think uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of listened. I've just done an important call, so I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. You just stay there. That's fine. Um. It's um, not Jacinda either, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wondered while you were talking, Pam, I can just remember I started nursing when I was 17, which is a long time ago, and this woman came to speak to us from emergency management, and she was really um, big, and she was very blunt, and she said, you're on your own, we won't be there for three days or five so get used to it, get good in your community. And you see, that's over 50 years ago, and I still remember that her message was community is everything and don't expect fire, ambulance, and everyone to arrive. And so I just think that that bottom part is so crucial, so thanks for that. Um, I just wanted to, two things I wanted to say. Um, one was just at the audit and risk yesterday, just wanting to make the link and the growth that I've seen in terms of emergency management and business continuity of this organisation during such things. So I think real progress has been made there and that it's we're not just for when the floods hit, it's a whole lot of other stuff, right. risk management and your, and I think just to up the planning that went into the summer, and I see people being impatient nationally about, well, why did we go into lockdown because there's no cases? Well, that's the very reason you plan and you go into lockdown so that you don't get cases, and success is sometimes uh, some of it, there's been no drama, and I think that's really important to acknowledge how successful that is and how important that planning that I know we on continues, even if you have five summers with no trouble. So I wanted to say that. And the other thing that I noticed at the regional meeting and wanted to update the work that you're doing is around EWI and a real focus there about um, the gaps and that bridge that needs building, which has been heightened in the awareness with the COVID um, response. And so all encouragement for you to be working in that. 
and for and if the, you know like for example I've got quite good links in with the women's refuge here like the Japanese messages and that of the world so if you were trying to work out who best to link in to your team's welfare group if you want any help with relationships please ask if I can be of help. Um, anything else anyone wants to say? I'm back. So it's all good. So it's all good. Well done. Thank you, Terry. Um, thank you, Anna. Um, and I'll declare the meeting closed. And we've done well in terms of time. And uh, there's a cup of coffee out there if we want to have a cup of coffee. And I not. Thank you, um, Rona. And Oh, we have to move and second the members' reports. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. So, Robert is moving and I'm seconding. All those in favour? Oh, Aye. Right. Thank you. Good morning, Alex. Can you please make sure you can join? Yeah, no, no, thanks. Really good. Good morning.